What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE Fantasy Football. It's Friday. It's the weekend, which means we're going over my rankings. We're going to talk about some players that I'm much higher on than ECR, expert consensus rankings, and some guys that I am lower on compared to expert consensus rankings. Mostly running backs, mostly wide receivers. We're just going to run through the list and see where the biggest numbers reside. Last couple of days have been fucking crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy with the election. Both sides are cheating. Both sides are not only counting multiple versions of every ballot, but they're also throwing out ballots. It's incredible. We live in America, 2020, and we just have a corrupt election. Allegedly. We're all going to court. I'm about to take y'all to court. I'm about to take y'all to school. So without further ado, I got fucking jeans on. Tuck your shirt in. Tuck your shirts in. Tuck them. <sighs> Stop yelling. And let's eat. So as we roll through thy rankings, if you want to sign up on Patreon, you will get my full rankings. Half PPR, standard, full PPR, every week. This is the only place that I post them. You also get access to our Discord channel. You get our Discord rankings. You get access to tomorrow's Q&A live stream, which I will be answering y'all's sit start questions, your trade target questions, your waiver wire questions, whatever kind of questions y'all have for me. I'll even, I even, eh, never mind, I'm not going to say that. Whatever you got, y'all can ask me then. Patreon.com forward slash BDGE. That is Zy place to be. Let's talk running bikes. So the only guy I'm really going to talk about within the top 10 or so for me would be Christian McCaffrey right now. Are we comfortable playing him? Of course you're fucking playing Christian McCaffrey. Going against KC, this should be fireworks galore. He should catch upwards of seven passes, if not more. What a million dollar rhyme right there. Traffic, traffic. Looking for my chapstick kind of shit. Christian McCaffrey. I know everyone's like, once you get a high ankle sprain, you're fucked, right? Here's the thing. Those guys who came back last year, Saquon and Alvin Kamara, came back in like three weeks. Of course, you're still going to be suffering from the side effects of high ankle sprains. Christian McCaffrey sat his ass on the bench for like six weeks. Sat there, laid in bed, had Olivia Culpa, ride him to the promised land for a month and a half. Six weeks. That's plenty of time. He's been practicing in full yesterday, the day before. Apparently, he's looked very good at practice. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I, I, it's full go for Christian McCaffrey for me. So right now, I have him at RB4, and that's being, that is being risk-averse, RB4. So if you have him, you're starting him. I'm not worried about fucking Mike Davis. Come on now. I also have Chase Edmonds up at running back seven, which is actually right around where ECR is. They have him at running back eight. So as long as Kenyon Drake is out, Chase Edmonds is a top 10 play. Been hyper-involved in the passing game. Going against my... You know what? One thing I need to start shaking... You know, once you're about a month and a half, six, seven, eight weeks into the season, you start to get a real feel for what teams are. And like, I still have that mindset where I'm like, oh, you know, you, you look at the schedule and you're like Dallas, Cincinnati, Jacksonville, Miami. You're like, oh, great slate of games. I still throw like the Miami defense into that box, even though I know that they're a good defense and they're a very, very good team relative to what we thought they were going into the season. So Miami is without, without a doubt, not an easy matchup for offensive players anymore. That being said, Chase Edmonds should be the feature workhorse. I do think, you know, Benjamin is absolutely worth a pickup. We don't know when Drake is going to be back. We don't know what percentage of health he's going to be at when he does come back. Re-injury risk is always going to be there. You know, Benjamin, super talented player out of Arizona State, caught a ton of passes in college. He could end up being a role player going down the stretch here. I like, you know, Benjamin a lot. So, I would stash him if you've got some room. I've got Justin Jackson all the way up at running back 14. His ECR is 17, so they have him about in that zone, but clearly the most talented running back in this bike field, getting the most touches, getting the most opportunity. They're playing against the Raiders, a defense that you could absolutely take advantage of. From the offensive perspective, Justin Herbert's been on fire! Straight out the dragon's mouth. Going to lead to a lot of points. Going to lead to open boxes. Okay. We're at a fucking strip club. Justin Jackson. Get him in your lineups. Rock solid RB2. 
could absolutely see him putting up RB1 production. Low end RB1 production. He's going to be in any lineup that I own him in. In that range, okay, so we're going to go like 14 through 18. So 14, Justin Jackson. We have Dobbins, DJ Dallas, Gus Edwards, Ezekiel Elliott. So I would start all those guys above Ezekiel Elliott, right? I've talked about this last week. Is why I was so low on Zeke. Talk about it again this week. Going against Pittsburgh, shit quarterback. I love how Mike McCarthy's like, he can't just come out and be like, Ben DiNucci fucking stinks. Fucking stinks, and that's why we don't want to start him at quarterback. He's got to be like, yeah, we want someone who's a little bit more experienced at quarterback, let alone none of these fuck Cooper Rush, Garrett Gilbert. None of them have experience playing in NFL games. Just say he fucking stinks, Mike McCarthy. Who are you trying to get over on? You think, you think lying is going to help you keep the job? You stink. You might be one and done. So we've got Jackson at 14. We've got J.K. Dobbins at 15. I think we'll continue to see J.K. Dobbins' role grow, right? He popped off last week, 113 yards on the ground against a very the, the toughest run defense in the league. Now he gets second toughest run defense in the league in the Indianapolis Colts. I just think this offense runs too heavily through the running backs, which is why I have J.K. Dobbins at 15, and I have Gus Edwards at 17. I like both of them. As I said on Twitter, Gus Edwards is just Gen Z's generation of Eddie Lacy explosive through the line. I saw someone put a crazy, crazy number up per NFL next gen stats. Gus Edwards ranks in terms of running back efficiency since he's come in the league has been top three among all NFL running backs in all three years. Like he's been wildly good. He explodes through the line. I mean, he's a jag in the sense of what they ask him to do and his role in the offense, but he is better. He's like in a, he's like Jordan Howard in a sense. Remember Jordan Howard's earlier years when every year we wanted to just be like, he's not that good of a running back. Got good vision, got good burst. He's got these intangibles where he just gets it done. That's what Gus Edwards is in the most run heavy offense in the NFL. And he's getting the goal line work, right? We're seeing that. So I like Gus. I like JK Dobbins. I'll be fine throwing both of them into my lineups this week as RB2s. Assuming Mark Ingram is in playing, which I don't think he's going to. I also have DJ Dallas up here at 16, which is way higher than consensus. Uh, ECR has him at 31. Playing at Buffalo, Buffalo's run defense has been absolutely trash. Straight trash, side of the fucking curb, Tuesday, Friday mornings type shit. DJ Dallas, this this is very, very much dependent on Carson and Hyde status. If one of them is active, I'm probably going to move both of them into like the 24 to 30 running back range. But if DJ Dallas in the same situation last week where he was with Travis Homer and Travis Homer was active, I think him being injured going into the game played a role in why he didn't play a role. Travis Homer should be a little bit more involved in this game, but... I wouldn't be surprised if it was just by a very incremental amount, assuming Hyde and Carson are both out because DJ Dallas, as I said last week, former wide receiver in both high school and college. That's why he caught five passes last week. Very inefficient on the ground, but San Francisco's defense is a very good run defense. Now they play Buffalo, much easier. Again, you just want to attach yourselves to people that are attached to or fantasy football players that are attached to Russell Wilson. It will equal points. You don't have to be good. We have fucking David Moore out here bowling. We got DJ Dallas, whose fat ass ran for like 41 yards on ninth. Now, I really like DJ Dallas as a prospect, but DJ Dallas, if Hyde and Carson are both inactive again, which is a very likely scenario, DJ Dallas, fire him up. RB2. You guys are already have watched last night's game, so I'm not going to cover like Tyler Irvin and Dexter Williams or anything like that. Who else we got? So I got Zeke way lower than consensus. San Francisco, I feel really good about starting Jamichael Hasty. I have Leonard Fournette above Rojo by a pretty significant amount this week after what we saw. You know, Rojo dropping that fucking pass. He's got cinder blocks for hands, which caused Bruce Arians to sit his ass on the bench and let Leonard Fournette ride the volume for the second straight week. We do have Antonio Brown coming in. Uh, who should take away some targets. We do possibly Chris Godwin might even be playing this week, which would be surprising, but it would make things a little bit interesting. They're going against the New Orleans Saints and uh, heard an interesting stat from, I think it was Mike Tags, and I don't remember the exact number. I want to say David Montgomery, his 86 rushing yards this year is the highest number that a running back had against the Saints defense since 2017. It's also not a defense that is friendly towards running backs. Although, they will be without, I, th- I want to say, Sheldon Rankins. So might be some more opportunity there to run the ball up the middle. Either way, low-end RB2 for me uh, for a guy like Leonard Fournette. Damian Harris is right behind him at running back 23. And I'm a little bit lower on the consensus. Most places have him top 20, if not a little bit higher. I get it. He's coming off the good game, playing at the New York Jets, where they should have some good game script for Damian Harris. But at the end of the day, this is one of those. I, I don't think his floor is as high as we think it is, and he's not a ceiling player to begin with. You know, he could probably go 16 for 75 and a touchdown. Wouldn't be surprised whatsoever. But that's also not like a great ceiling play. That's, you know, 13, 14 points, half PPR. And he's not going to catch any passes. It's just not what he does. 
I think there's also a chance that he goes like 11 for 35, though. I think that I think that's in his range of possibilities here. So I've got Zach Moss. I mean, I've got Damian Harris at 23. I got Zach Moss right behind him at 24. Singletary down at 29. So I have Zach Moss above Singletary. Seattle has not necessarily been a great defense to try to run the ball against, but Zach Moss has seen his snap counts increasingly go up week by week since he's returned from injury. And on the flip side, we've seen Singletary still getting touches. His snap counts coming down, down, down. It's like fucking waterfall up there. Zach Moss has some jetpack shit on his bike and going straight up in terms of snap counts, touches. He's getting all the 10 zone touches, getting all the valuable touches here. So this is a game where both teams are going to have to score points. I want to say the over under is like 54. So they're expecting Josh Allen to score points. They're expecting Russell Wilson, obviously to fucking throw up a 35 burger, something like that. So there will be scoring opportunities here. I like Zach Moss as a back end RB2. I've got DeAndre Swift at 25. I don't think that's out of control whatsoever. I'm seven spots lower than ECR. He's 18 in ECR. I don't know how after last week we could feel confident putting Swift back into our lineups as a really strong RB2 play. There is some shit going on with the quarterbacks, of course. Matt Stafford put on the COVID list, but now he supposedly can end up playing and might end up playing without practicing as long as he tests negative every day. Up until then, I believe he can play, which would make me feel better about Swift. But like Galladay's out, and I don't know, maybe Chase Daniel being in there would lead to more dump offs. I don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty there. And with the whole committee, him getting six carries last week for negative one yards, I do think he'll catch like four to five passes, which is a nice floor. But if he's not getting involved in the ground, I don't know if I want to coin flip it with DeAndre Swift. And then I've got Jordan Howard at running back 27, which. Most of this shit, I guess, isn't updated because that's 32 fucking spots above ECR. They have him down at running back 59. A lot of people probably don't update their rankings until Saturday, Sunday morning. But the Miami situation is kind of fucked, right? You got Miles Gaskins on the IR. Matt Breed's got a hamstring injury, and it's not expected that he does suit up. So Jordan Howard kind of becomes the guy, and they've got Malcolm Perry, this dude from, I think he went, he played at like Navy or something. He called like a zillion passes or uh, had, this, I, I don't know. He had a ton of touches in, in college, I remember, but he's kind of like a weapon more so than just a pure running back. And then they've got Patrick Laird and Lynn Bowden. So it should be, uh, it should be interesting. I'm not going to get cute here. I, I don't really want to start anyone in that backfield, but I think Jordan Howard would be a flex play. He's definitely the guy that they would trust the most, right? He was getting touches in the beginning of the year. I think he's a guy that knows the offense well, who they will give the carries to, whatever that will turn out to amount to. I don't really know. Probably not going to catch a lot of passes, but I definitely do not trust the other guys in this backfield. So I'm just going to stay away unless I'm super desperate. I'm okay throwing Jordan Howard into Zaire. What else do we got? All right. So I got Jonathan Taylor, 10 spots lower than ECR. Most people have him at 22. I'm at 32. I don't know how you could look at what happened last week and feel good about it. Now he's playing on kind of like a bummed ankle. I know he should be fine and he should be suiting up, but they play the Ravens, a really tough run defense, and we don't know what the split's going to be. I'm assuming Taylor still like has control of the backfield, but What's the leash there? You know, is Jordan Wilkins going to be the hot hand again? Is he going to out carry Jonathan Taylor? Who's going to get the goal line work? Is Jonathan Taylor going to get any pass catching work? Too many question marks for me to get excited about Jonathan Taylor. I do have him ranked above Jordan Wilkins. I have Jonathan Taylor at RB 32. I have Wilkins at RB 34. And I got Naeem Hines all the way down at like RB 41. So I want no piece of him coming off the big game. That's what he does. He has big games. He excites everybody. And then he fucking stinks after that for five games. Then he has big game. Excites everybody. Guess what he does after that? Fucking stinks after that, okay? That's why I'm looking at Naeem Hines. What else do we got here? I don't know why. This is just total, complete gut feeling. Complete gut feeling. Rex Burkhead, running back 36. 10 spots higher than ECR at 46. This just feels like a game where Rex Burkhead... Like, Rex Burkhead is the only, is the only running back where game script doesn't matter. This is a game where I feel like... He'll get eight carries just because they'll beat the Jets, but he'll be involved in the passing game for no fucking reason, and he'll get the goal line carries, and I have no actual logical reason why I like Rex Burkhead, but it feels like this is a Rex Burkhead game. I'm, I'm going to put Rex Burkhead in one of my lineups, and I'll screenshot it, and I'll put it on Twitter so that when he pops off, I won't look like a fraud. You have Rex Burkhead. You're starting him over Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, James Conner, Christian Calvary, Derek Henry, James Robinson. Don't fucking at me. Let's move over to the wide receivers. Also, those were, I just realized those were standard rankings, not half PPR, but I don't think anything really moved too significantly there. And maybe a few, maybe a few things, but the general gist of the player analysis there was spot on still kind of, kind of. And again, if y'all want to just shut me up 
and go look at my rankings right now available on patreon.com forward slash bdge in standard half ppr full ppr all them shits let's move over to the wide receiver let's talk about some guys that are supposed to get shadow coverage okay this is per pff we have Allen robinson against malcolm butler of the titans now i'll also throw out the qualified cornerback coverage ranking so obviously pff gives a grade to each cornerback in terms of like how well they're doing in coverage up to this point on the year and they've qualified 115 malcolm butler is 37th out of 115 so he's about in the top third percentile maybe even a little bit better than that so that's not exactly an easy matchup for Allen robinson i have him right now at wide receiver 13 they're playing at tennessee i mean Allen robinson's a fucking animal obviously pure alpha in every sense of the word but you have a tough matchup you have just the inconsistency at quarterback. You just never know what you're getting at quarterback. So you're obviously not sitting him, but I am looking at him as a back-end wide receiver one, high-end wide receiver two, rather than the pure alpha that he is just from a physical specimen standpoint. Next up, we have four shadow coverage possibilities for the week. DJ Chark against Bradley Roby. And in that same game, LaVisca Chenault against Vernon Hargraves. DK Metcalf, Tredavious White. So we'll go into the Jacksonville-Houston game. Bradley Roby's been quietly very good in shadow coverage this year. He's the only cornerback that's had the shadow in every single game up to this point. He is the 22nd ranked coverage cornerback of 115 qualified. So that's really high up. Now, DJ Chark's going to be playing with Jake Lutton. Luton, I still don't know how to play the game. I listen to 46 podcasts this week, and I still don't know how to say the dude's name. I have DJ Chark very, very, very low. I have Matt wide receiver 32. ECR is him at 26. So I guess I'm a little, I'm a little bit lower, not crazy, crazy lower, but Chark has dealt with his own inconsistencies on the year. Now he's playing with the new quarterback. We don't know where this quarterback's targets are going to go. Is he going to be a dump off guy to James Robinson? Is he going to like LaVisca Chenault because he's playing around the line of scrimmage? Gia Chark, still a very good wide receiver. A lot of question marks here. So he's more of a mid to wide, uh, mid to back end wide receiver three. It is a relatively tough matchup against Bradley Roby. We're on the flip side. The reason that I'm, uh, I'm low on DJ Chark is because this is a defense, Houston. It's a run funnel. So I expect James Robinson to get 20 plus carries in this game, without a doubt. I expect a guy like LaVisca Chenault who's going against Vernon Hargraves. Now, Vernon Hargraves, 110th ranked cornerback of 115 possible qualified CBs. That is a beautiful matchup. I don't know if that's necessarily going to translate into points. I have LaVisca at wide receiver 40 right now. So I, I'm not like excited about him because every time we think like Visca is just not a guy where you could just, he's, he's like a matchup depending guy. You don't look at him you're like, oh, he's got a really good matchup this week against his cornerback or this team. Let's fire him up. He's like a guy that they create plays for, you know? So that's not necessarily like matchup dependent. If you're going to give him like screens and carries and let him play fucking quarterback and stuff, that's not, that has nothing to do with who you're playing against or who you're getting covered by. And I think that's the reason why we see a lot of these like Curtis Samuel types have games against teams that you would never expect him to have games against like that so when it comes to visca i mean the matchup is way better than dj charks if these projections hold out but it's hard to get excited because he's just been kind of wildly inconsistent again he does his backup quarterback now this is where things get interesting dk metcalf versus Tavius white i said on yesterday's fade the public episode which is one of my favorite episodes that we've dropped all in, in the history of that show so if you missed yesterday's episode of fade the public highly recommend you go back and watch it and we we're talking about rest of season guys that you'd rather own and we got into discussion about like Tyler Lockett versus uh DK Metcalf and obviously like rest of the season I'd rather have DK Metcalf but Animal was like do you think they're just going to completely switch games on and off it's gonna be like this is a Metcalf game this is a Tyler Lockett game the way I'm looking at it right now and the way I think really is truthful around what the situation is is that it's always a DK Metcalf game unless the defense completely sells out to stop DK Metcalf when you look at basically every game, Russ's first and second look is to DK Metcalf down the field. If they're covering him, double coverage, a really good shadow coverage cornerback or something like that, then he looks Lockett's way. But most of the time, Metcalf, I think, has cemented himself as the alpha there. This is one of those rare situations where I actually have Lockett as a wide receiver seven, Metcalf as a wide receiver eight, because I very much expect Tredavious White to shadow DK Metcalf. Tredavious White's obviously a fucking baller. I think this is one of those teams where Buffalo's defense first off, has not been good to start with. And their last couple of years have built up to a point where we thought they were going to be, you know, on the precipice of being an elite defense, especially against your fantasy players. But with DK Metcalf, Tredavious White, I think they'll probably throw a safety over the top and they'll limit him to, you know, not a, not the game that he had last week and not these big blow up games that he's had. So, I mean, he's obviously someone that could take it to the cribbo on any fucking play, which is why he's still, you know, wide receiver eight for me. But this seems more like a Tyler Lockett game 
than a DK Metcalf because the defense is going to sell out for them. Okay, so those are the four shadow coverage cornerbacks expected to stick on these wide receivers for week nine. Allen Robinson, Malcolm Butler, DJ Chark, Bradley Roby, LaVisca Chenault, Vernon Hargraves, DK Metcalf, Trade V. Yes, White. The other matchup that I feel like should be considered a shadow coverage matchup would be James Bradbury versus Terry McLaurin. For whatever reason, they do not list that as being a shadow coverage matchup. And when they played in week six, apparently he did not shadow Terry. Uh, if any of y'all are Giants fans or football team fans, let me know about that. That seems questionable. And it seems questionable that they would not have Bradbury on McLaurin. So PFF says they're not gonna. I think they probably will. Week six, Terry went seven for 74 and 12 targets coming off a really big game against Dallas. Seems like him and Kyle Allen are starting to really click. So Terry, I'm not worried about. I have him as wide receiver 12. So he's a wide receiver one for me. Bo show. And Michael Thomas too. Michael Thomas is wide receiver 11. So I have him up at 11. He's like a Christian McCaffrey type thing where if he's playing, he's in my lineup. You drafted him to fucking play him. He's been back at practice. So hopefully he's getting up there in terms of health and he's ready to play. I know Drew Brees in New Orleans wants his offense back so they can stop being so fucking one dimensional and just giving every single pass to Alvin Kamara. So Michael Thomas will be up there as a, as a low end wide receiver one. I think if he plays well, obviously a tough matchup. Carlton Davis has been fucking balling. As long as he is out there healthy, plays fully, plays 80, 85% of the snaps, looks good, then he will continue to rise up the rankings. But he would be in my lineup for sure. The other guy we need to talk about for sure is Antonio Brown, also making his debut. Now, this will probably depend a little bit on Chris Godwin's status, who is like day-to-day -day plus week-to-week -week plus fucking month-to-month. -month. I don't know. Antonio Brown, I have him up. This is going to be bold. Wide receiver 22. Now, if you're a little bit more risk averse, I can totally understand why you'd have him much lower. I have him at 22. ECR has him at 33. Bruce Aarons came out. You know, he said, I'm sure most of y'all have heard this by now. You know, we don't know if he's going to play 10 snaps. We don't know if he's going to play 35 snaps. I doubt he plays 65 snaps. He needs to understand the offense, but that didn't stop him from absolutely bowling out with Tom Brady when they played in New England for that one fucking game they had together. I have no doubt that Brown is going to step on the field and be the most dominant force on that offense from day one. But it's going to be up to their personnel, their their coaches, whoever, to decide how long he stays on the field for. I highly doubt that Tom Brady will give a shit what he knows. If he needs to tell him what route to run on every single play, I'm sure he will be fine with that. This is a game where the Saints will probably score a lot. Tampa Bay is going to score a lot. Actually, I picked them as my anti-fantasy orgy last night. But I still think Ant Antonio Brown balls looks really good. I think he's going to end up going like five for 70 in a touchdown. I think he gets into the end zone. I will be starting him pretty confidently there. And then you got the Pittsburgh situation, man. This is kind of fucked. So right now, I'll, I'll just straight up say I have uh, Chase Claypool's wide receiver 19, which is exactly where ECR has them. Deontay Johnson, I have a wide receiver 21. ECR has him at 23. Then I have Juju at 24. ECR has him at 21. So I have it Claypool, Johnson, Juju. ECR has it Claypool, Juju, Johnson. I like Claypool more because one, I just don't like Juju. I don't trust him at all at this point. Two, Johnson, while he's been full and he's off the injury report, I don't trust that he's 100% healthy at all. And I think like Deontay and Juju have been more volume type plays, whereas Chase Claypool can go like four for 100 on any given game. And this is a matchup where it seems really good on paper, Dallas. But since Dak has gone out, like most of the quarterbacks they've played haven't thrown for over 200 yards. They've been finishing between like 170 and 200 yards. It's not because Dallas' defense has been any better. It's because the opposing team runs the ball so fucking much and runs it so effectively. And I think we're going to see a game where James Conner gets like 20 to 25 plus carries, and they're not going to need to throw the ball that much. So of these guys, where Johnson is a big play guy, but like Claypool seems like he's taken over that role almost exclusively as the downfield threat. Whereas I don't think they're going to need to dink and dump. I don't think they're going to have, you know, 35 to 40 pass attempts from Big Ben, which kind of leads me to like a, a more Chase Claypool type game. But again, I, I have all, all three of those guys as top 24 wide receivers, which probably won't work out because it never does. All right. As we move down the list a little bit more, some guys that I think are fine for like flex plays, wide receiver three-ish area. Uh, I've got Sterling Shepard up at wide receiver 29. You saw a lot of uh, a lot of volume last week coming back from his first game, so I feel pretty good about him against Washington. John Brown's right behind him, wide receiver 30. I have him five spots higher than consensus. Going against Seattle, again, this is the matchup where they're expecting a lot of points thrown up between Josh Allen and Russell Wilson. I know John Brown's been dealing with the injury. I know it's gotten really messy over there, but 
it's hard to pass up a, a matchup against Seattle. He's got another week to kind of rest up, and hopefully he gets a little bit better. And last week, they only had to throw the ball like 15 to 20 times because the weather was shitty, and they just, you know, they didn't. That was not their game plan going in. This will be very different going into it this time. So I like, I got John Brown as a top 30 wide receiver right behind him. Tim Patrick. Dealing with the hamstring injury, I do believe he plays this week, and they get Atlanta. Tim Patrick like pretty much was the alpha prior to getting hurt. With Corlin Sutton sidelined, it's basically Tim Patrick's possession job to lose. If he's on the field, I am getting him in my lineup against Atlanta. Wide receiver 31, fucking 34 spots higher than ECR. Get your shit together. Amari Cooper down to 34, 10 spots lower than ECR. I don't know how you could possibly throw any of the Dallas Cowboys wide receivers into your lineup with any sort of confidence. And uh, I got Russell Gage up at 37. So he is startable for me, 10 spots higher than ECR because Calvin Ridley is out. Russell Gage will benefit from his absence. And Denver is just not a team that is good against the pass. If we want to go a little bit deeper, we're looking at Indy versus Baltimore. Tough matchup, obviously. They're going to be without Marlon Humphrey, Zach Pascal, Marcus Johnson, I don't hate those guys. I don't hate those guys on Indy. Two guys to look at if you're in a deep league, if you're really, really desperate. I think you can make some uh, some fucking crib calls to those boys out in Indy. That's all I got for wide receivers. All right. Well, I hate quarterbacks and I hate tight ends. Everyone in those rankings fucking stinks. So we're not even going to get into those guys. If you want to see them, if you need help with your sit starts, you can either one, get my rankings at Patreon, or two, still go over to Patreon and sign up because you'll get access to tomorrow's live stream Q&A where you could jump in with me live on YouTube, ask any questions you got, and I will do my best to answer them. Or y'all can hit me up with questions via the social media, which is right here. Follow me on Instagram, follow the brand's Instagram, follow me on Twitter. Uh, Yes, that is it. Do that, do that. Do something about a social media shit. And that's all I got for today. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe to Z's channel if you are new. And Z make sure that you sign up for Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash BDGE. Goodbye.